Good evening and welcome to the Thursday, April 10th, 2014 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. I'm Mayor David Narkowitz, and we will begin tonight's meeting by my asking the clerk to call the roll of the school committee. Ms. Wiedemann. Present. 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 Here. Mr. Howard Here. 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 Present. Thank you very much. Um, we're actually going to begin uh, tonight's meeting with a very special uh, presentation. Um, and uh, I have the honor this evening of issuing a proclamation that I'm going to read. And we have some, um, some, some special young people who are here tonight, along with Barbara Black, who's our early childhood uh, education coordinator. Um, who are going to accept the proclamation. Um, the proclamation is in honor of the Week of the Young Child, which we celebrate each year. Um, and this year, uh, the focus of this Week of the Young Child, April 5th through April 12th, 2014, uh, we're, we're calling in Northampton Brain Building in Progress Week. Mm -hmm. So the proclamation reads, whereas the Week of the Young Child is an annual celebration established in 1971 by the National Association for the Education of Young Children to recognize that children's early years are the foundation for later success in school and life, and whereas the Department of Early Education and Care and its partners have declared that Massachusetts will celebrate the week as Brain Building in Progress Week, and whereas research demonstrates that more brain development occurs during a child's first five years than at any other time in a child's life, and whereas a high quality early education nurtures a child's cognitive, social, emotional, and physical development and helps build a so solid foundation for future success, and whereas investments in young children and their early education have a lifetime impact on young learners in terms of greater academic readiness and educational attainment, greater earnings, better health, reduced crime, and reduced need for social services, and whereas the Commonwealth has responded to this growing body of research by providing a strong foundation for a statewide system of high quality early education and care, Whereas the purpose of Brain Building in Progress Week is to add to this momentum by focusing public attention on the needs of young children and their families and by recognizing the early childhood educators who meet these needs. Now, therefore, I, Mayor David J. Narkowitz, do hereby proclaim April 5th through the 12th, 2014, as Brain Building in Progress Week in Northampton and urge all citizens to recognize and support the needs of young children and their families in our community. In witness whereof, I have set my hand and affixed the seal of the city of Northampton this April 10th, 2014, David J. Narkowitz, Mayor. And we have some guests this evening. Sam, Olivia, and Allie are here. Uh, as long as... Uh, at, at the podium. I want to introduce. Yes. Okay. Nothing like being disoriented. <laughs> so I want to introduce Olivia and Sam okay. and Allie Busson, who are Northampton children. Who um, Allie is in first grade at Leeds, and Sam and Olivia will be in kindergarten next year, and right now are at Meadowlark Child Care Center, and. Um, so they have some things they wanted to give to school committee members. Um, they're going to give you um, a flyer about the festival that we have this Saturday. Um, and I'd love to have you share it with anybody that you know that has young children. Um, we do this every year, and it's at the Jackson Street School. And from 10 to 12, it's free. It's very fun. We usually have a few hundred young children and their families. and. Um, so we're hoping that um, you guys will send your friends or come yourselves. <clears throat> also, um, Sam and Allie and Olivia have a magnet that they're going to give you, which you can, if you have or know young children, you can put it on their refrigerator. And it has um, the website of the state 
um, Brain Building in Progress campaign, which has calendars of lots of events, including lots of events that are happening in Northampton. So, um, so I just want people to know that and thank um, the mayor for the proclamation and all of you for all of your support. Um, and one of the things that um, the Department of Early Education and Care keeps telling us that, is that we are all brain builders and we are all building brains and we were all creating brain building zones. So the fact is kids are learning everywhere, whether it's in school, in the supermarket, you know, in restaurants, in parks, when they're taking a walk. So um, it's just, it's great that you guys are all here to support us. Thanks. Thank you, Barbara. All right, and you guys are giving out your things. Okay. And I actually have, this is very silly, I thought I had enough of these, but I only have one. So if someone would like the I am a brain builder button, I am happy to I have one pass it along. And maybe I actually well. think that. I'll trade you a proclamation for it. Okay. I, I was thinking that the mayor as the chief much. officer should be the chief Thank brain builder. <laughs> okay. So we're going to give you the him. He's going to be back okay. late. He's going to be late. All right. Thank there you. There you go. Thank you very much. Hello. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good job, guys. Yay for thank early you. education. So. Yes. The rest of the thing. I don't know, it's going to be all downhill from here, I think, so. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much again. Did oh, you get a magnet? Um, I did. Uh, That's Ed's. Oh, Ed's. Well, it's fine. I'll be okay. I'll be okay. Thank you. Okay, so we'll now move into the next uh, phase of the agenda, which is the public comment period. Um, oh, have another. Thank oh. you. Thank you so much. Okay, for my car, too. Okay. Um, so, is there anyone who wishes to speak during the public comment period this evening? I do not see anyone who wishes to speak in the public comment period. So, we will then move on to announcements by city councilors. Do any city councilors have any announcements? Are there any city councilors? City council, school committee. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. Needed. It's been a long, long day. A school committee. Sorry about that. I think because we met last time in the city council chambers, I must, I must have this vibe with you guys. Well, I just think we should announce just clearly once again that sat this Saturday, April 12th, is the Children's Festival that they were talking about over at Jackson Street. So it's 10 to noon this Saturday. So, and I've gone. Um, pretty much every year and it's great fun for little kids yep. and me. I know we're going to have a bunch of city vehicles there, fire trucks, yeah. ambulances, dump trucks as well that the kids will be able to play on. So, um, Okay, so uh, any other announcements from school committee members, other elected officials? Um, okay, so we now have the consent agenda uh, and the consent agenda contains a a set of minutes, the superintendent screening committee uh, minutes of March 10th, March 11th, and March 12th, 2014, the negotiating committee meeting of March 13th, the special school committee meeting of March 17th, the budget and property subcommittee meeting of March 20th, the special school committee meeting of March 25th, and the regular school committee meeting of March 27th, 2014. We also have two contracts. One is a with uh, um, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, uh, JFK Math Textbooks, $34,992. Uh, and then McGraw-Hill Education uh, for the NHS Integrated Math Textbooks, $22,922.82. We also have two field trip requests. Uh, Bridge Street, uh, second grade, uh, Connecticut Science Center in Hartford, April 30th, 2014, and the Ryan Road, fifth grade, uh, Connecticut Science Center, Hartford, Connecticut, May 2nd, 2014. 
I would accept a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Okay. All those in favor of the consent agenda say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. The consent agenda is approved. Next, we move to reports and recommendations, and we will begin with a report from our uh, student representatives, and I believe we have uh, Emily uh, Stam and Dylan Weaver are with us tonight, so I'll turn the floor over to you. So we're not sure if you've heard, but a re recently a previous, previously a previous a teacher that was at NHS last year, Miss um, Gardner was under attack. Um, she was a victim of a hate, hate crime um, uh, a little, really, really recently. And this has been really present in our school and has not only um, initiated um, discussion and discourse about the topic, but there's been a real um, outpouring of support for her. Um, the first way that this that this is physically apparent is there was a huge banner in the front of our school, um, in the front hallway, um, wh that had painted painted on it. We love Miss Gardner with these markers, and everyone was writing these really sweet things up to like paragraphs, and it was really moving. Um, and the second way is that the student head of the Devil's Advocate, our um, high school newspaper, is writing an editorial not only about her experience but also. Um, uh, quoting different students and their not only reaction to it but support of her. Uh, in the arts, we have the band trip coming up, so everyone's excited. They fundraised and now they finally get to go to Carnegie Hall. And we just recently put on the Music Man, which Dylan was a part of, and that was also that was a huge success. So it's gorgeous outside and. With this beautiful weather, um, spring sports are really kicking in, getting, going from gyms where they've been practicing in to the first week or two being outside. And this is, this is even more apparent because in the past week, lots of sports have had their first competitions with other, other schools. Um, for instance, uh, a sport that I that is near and dear to my heart that I'm a part of, Ultimate Frisbee, last year was the first year that we had a girls team. And this year, it's really amazing. Not only do we have a girls varsity, junior varsity, we also have a boys varsity, junior varsity B, and junior varsity A. So that's really amazing, seeing them, all these new people go out and going out and competing for the first time. And. Uh, we just had our junior induction ceremony for the National Honor Society, and this year we had a record number of inductees for the junior class. Um, Ms. Hale gave a speech that really resonated with students. She did an excellent job talking about um, her life and what she's learned, and she really shared a lot of wisdom. Um, additionally, course catalogs have just come out for the underclassmen. Um, there are a few changes this year from previous years. Uh, one of them is how they're doing the history. They used to just have U.S. history and then AP U.S. history, but now there are th um, three options. There's early U.S., honors early U.S., and then uh, the AP. So that's one change, as well as wellness is now being combined from wellness A and B to just one wellness class which all the seniors are really mad about because they needed to go through two classes of wellness. Um, but nothing can really damper senior spirit this, these past couple weeks. Um, uh, the, last, the last of the rejection letters and acceptance letters have been trickling in, and there's been lots and lots of joy and camaraderie, but there's been a lot of really sad moments that we've all been able to share because of this really, really cool thing at my school, at our school, which I'm really impressed with. Um, the wall of shame and the wall, the wall of mild disappointment, <laughs> where um, students put up their rejection letters and their waitlist letters. Um, I wish I had applied to Harvard just so I could say that I got rejected from Harvard, um, which my, my parents were aghast at, that, that we did this, and we did this to ourselves, but it's really, amazing to feel really terrible about yourself that you didn't get into that college and see that lots of other people didn't get into lots of other colleges and it really built not only the community at NHS but the seniors senior class thank you thank you okay 
Thank you very much for that report. Mm -hmm. The next item on our agenda is the uh, collaborative representative report uh, from Ms. Minnick, as well as a vote uh, required relative to the uh, CES articles of agreement. So I will uh, turn the floor over to uh, Lisa Minnick, and I know that we're here, we're joined here this evening by William Deal, who's the executive director of CES. So just to give you some background, um, particularly those of you who are new, uh, Northampton District is a member of an educational collaborative. It's an educational service agency, a nonprofit agency formed by law, uh, one of many in the state nonprofit agencies formed by law in the 1970s. Uh, to provide cost-effective services for low incidence populations in their districts initially. And so Northampton has been a member of the collaborative since the start. Um, we recently said goodbye to our executive director of over 20 years, Joan Schumann, and we actually undertook a rather exhaustive nationwide search to look for a successor for her. and spent a lot of money to find somebody who was right under our noses, the deputy director at the agency for the past three and a half years, Bill Deal, who quickly surfaced as the most qualified and also one of our favorite candidates just because of his passion and for education and his interest in the collaborative and his understanding of what it does and what it is. So um, he took over the reins as executive director of the collaborative on March the 1st. I should back up and say that I have been Northampton's representative to the board of directors of the collaborative for over 20 years because I think I'd been on the board for about six months when we hired the previous director. So I was I was on the hiring team for that. Now I've hired this one and I'm going to fade out into the sunset <laughs> right away and on my horse pretty soon. Um, but uh, so I've been around for a long time. I think it's been, we tried to count it the other day, I think it's been at least a dozen years that I've been the chair of the board there. So, and as such, I've had the privilege to attend a number of national conferences regarding educational service agencies. Um, and I have to tell you that the Collaborative for Educational Services here in Northampton is possibly the leading collaborative in the, in the state, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, as far as um, its scope of services, its breadth of offerings, and also its ability. It serves as a role model. It's also been responsible in some way or another for helping to define legislation regarding collaboratives and for um, writing a number of position papers that would advise our, our former director also testified on a number of legislative committees and sat with the Commissioner of Education. So we've had a good deal of input into what an educational service agency in the Commonwealth could be. Um, a few years ago, there was a bit of a, of a problem, a financial problem, in one of the collaboratives in the North Shore. North Shore or South Shore? North Shore. Yeah. North. North Shore. Um, which prompted lawmakers to uh, revise, to create some new legislation revising the, the way that collaboratives are put together and governed. This new uh, law regulates us with a bit more oversight and accountability. It requires more transparency and it ha it's got some very clear requirements for financial management of collaboratives. Um, and among the first things that we were required to do was not just have a business manager, but to hire for the board to hire a treasurer that would supervise and make sure the business manager was doing the right thing. And he's sitting over there. <laughs> so before he was here, and, and he's still over there, uh, serving as the treasurer for the board of the collaborative for educational wow. services. So uh, he comes in periodically and just looks over things to make sure that the business manager is doing things properly and then we do also have an annual audit done every year because we have a number of federal grants and state grants so we have we have a lot of a lot of um, accountability hoops to jump through so in however the new legislation um, 
created some new requirements for for collaborative boards, including the need for training for board members, uh, greater financial accountability, and several other things. So in view of the changes in the law, we it, those changes necessitated that the collaborative itself revise our articles of agreement to comply with these new state requirements. The, they've been gone through with fine tooth comb for I think two and a half years and they've gone back and forth to and from the state and they have finally given us the okay for them. Now they must go to every member district school committee and be approved by those school committees be, and then they get sent back to the state for final approval. So Dr. Deal is here tonight to do some basic quick presentation regarding those uh, the new articles of agreement and also to just bring you a up to date a little bit on the state of the collaborative and thank you, Lisa. Northampton. So I, I will I will be brief. I know you have a long agenda. I just first of all I want to thank Lisa Minnick for her service on our board. Very loyal. She she's probably the most active board member for years and years. And the collaborative have gotten where it's gotten largely because of Lisa's leadership. So thank you, Lisa. And Superintendent Nash has been a real supporter of the collaborative both here and in previous positions, so thank you. And I also want to thank all of you serving here. My wife and I lived in Northampton for 20 years. And I've been certainly following and aware of the steady hand that the school committee has given the schools of Northampton. And as a citizen of Northampton, I appreciate very much your services. Uh, so I just passed around a little booklet that describes our services briefly. If you don't know much about us, Basically, I'll be brief, there are four major areas. Uh, one area, it was the area we started with, was direct services for kids, especially special needs students. Students, as Lisa said, who are uh, at risk of failure. Um, and we do uh, increasingly uh, a, lot of, a lot with early childhood education, with after school programming, and other direct services. Secondly, we do a lot with teacher professional development. And that's a whole range of things, including uh, working with districts to help them meet the mandates that are coming down from the state fast and furious. So we provide a lot of support with educator evaluation, DDMs, et cetera. Um, thirdly, we try to be responsive to our member districts. And I meet with all the superintendents to get a sense of what they're, what they're looking for. And lastly, we are advocates for our member districts and collaboratives. And one quick example of that, I was glad to see Barbara Black here. Uh, last week, the uh, commissioner of the early childhood uh, department was in, in Northampton at the collaborative. And Barbara was one of many people who came to that and gave the, gave the uh, commissioner quite uh, an earful about the needs of our area. So the commissioner is very familiar with Boston, Springfield, Worcester, and doesn't quite have a sense of what the needs are in the more rural areas. So he heard a lot about that and took good things back with him, I think. That's another role that we see ourselves playing. So on the inside of this little booklet, there's a colorful chart. And this is uh, described with the X's, what services Northampton uh, avails itself uh, of with the collaborative. You can see that almost everything that we provide Northampton is partnered with or takes advantage of. And we hope that will continue in the future and expand and we're delighted at uh, our collaboration over the years. So that said, um, as Lisa said, we need a vote on the Articles of Agreement. And I'm, well, I'm open to questions if there are any about the Articles. Any questions, Mr. Moore? Yeah, I, had, I had one question. It was more of a curiosity thing as I was reading through. I discovered that there was a provision for charter schools to be members of the collaborative. Not only, not only provisions, the state requires that they can join they can, the collaborative. Right, they can be. It was assumed they could because in terms of uh, we saw it in the governance that you, know, you have to be a member of the board of directors. But then I went back up to look again at the member schools and I did not see any charter schools. We don't have any charter school members, no. We only have public school members right now in Franklin, Hampshire counties. Well, charter schools are public schools. Um, no, I, well, I'm, yeah. But I mean the school districts. I'm so, so what is the, um, do, you, do you know, is, there, is it a financial barrier to them joining? Or do you know why there are no charter schools that are part of the collaborative? Uh, none have asked to join, but we are open to that. It should not be a financial barrier. No, it shouldn't be a Our barrier. membership dues are $2.50 per student enrolled in the district or school. So it's really, I mean, for Northampton, the number of students we have are membership dues are in the neighborhood of $30,000. So 
it wouldn't seem cost prohibitive for a charter school to afford to. I think the other part of the answer is that it's the recent regulations that have now said that char charter schools can belong to collaboratives. So up until this point, there was never an effort to either them join the collaboratives or collaboratives reach out to them. So I think there's a change in legislation here that's going to cause more interaction between, between the two. When did that change take place? Just that re it was just recently, so that it's, it's it is recent. The legislation is a year and a half old. The regulations came out last year, and all the, all the collaborators right now are getting these agreements pulled together, which then will make this official in our area. Other questions relative to the collaborative or the um, the articles of agreement that we need to take a look. At? If none, I would ask if you would like to make a motion to put those forward uh, yes I move that the Northampton School Committee approve the articles of agreement for the collaborative for educational services as presented second are there any questions uh, further questions or discussion on the motion hearing none all those in favor please say aye aye, aye. aye. opposed any abstentions the motion carries the articles are approved you get your signature Okay. Wow. Okay. Congratulations, too. Um, I, I just wanted to make two further comments. One of which is part of the new regulations are that your board representative to the collaborative has to come back and report to you quarterly, I think, on what's going on at the collaborative. Something that I usually don't do at like 10:45 at night. I just let it go but I'm going to have to put myself on the agenda uh, or ask to be put on the agenda for every so often so that I can update you because it's required by law um, and the other thing I was going to say was uh, if you recall one of my um, comments regarding our new superintendent John Provost was that I thought he would be a good supporter of the collaborative because he began his career as a paraprofessional with the collaborative back when it was called Hampshire Educational Collaborative and he also served as a special education director for another collaborative in the eastern part of the state for a period of time so it's my hope that he will be um, he, that he will continue Northampton's involvement with the collaborative and continue to have the district avail itself of services from the collaborative and also that he will serve as a unifying force for the superintendents. There is a, I should tell you that there's a steering committee made up of superintendents. There's a board made up of school committee representatives. They also have job alike groups for, um, you know, like a, for um, special education directors, business managers, tech people. And so all of those people have the opportunity to get together with their peers and colleagues in similar jobs from other districts in Franklin and Hampton counties. And um, so it's, I think it's a, it, it is exactly what its name says. It's an opportunity for collaboration between all of those people. So um, I'm looking forward to our new superintendent being a big supporter of the collective as well. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. And thank you for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you. So uh, the next item on our agenda is the. Um, is the final vote on the FY15 uh, budget for the Northampton Public Schools um, as a follow-up to our recent discussion and we have you have before you now the bound copy of it and I know that the um, superintendent has also included her message in it and so I would turn the floor over to the superintendent to um, Mr. Scott. Well since neither uh, Mr. Scott or I have been here at this time before, I'm not sure how to proceed. Um, I would tell you that we've made absolutely no changes over what the board saw at your special meeting in March, um, that we do have a budget book which mirrors the type of format that you've used before in Northampton, and that um, we would be happy, Don would be happy, to uh, lead you through the budget book if that's what you would like done. I'm just not sure how you would proceed. It might be helpful to just uh, to just walk people through, okay. not line by line, but um, but obviously just 
point mm -hmm. out the various mm -hmm. parts of it just so mm -hmm. that people will understand. Yeah. I, before I turn it over to Don, I just mentioned that in my um, message or the superintendent's report, I really wanted to um, speak on behalf of the administrative team in terms of the fact that we're very grateful um, to the school committee for um, what appears to be um, not only level service but also an additional increase, um, which the mayor was very understanding of our cuts that took place last year and was able to provide us with a little bit of additional monies to, to help put some new positions in. And um, when Don goes through that, again, we'll talk about those new positions. But, um, you know, it's been an interesting process, and I'm very pleased the administrative team has worked very well together to prioritize across schools the needs that we have. And that's not to say that we don't have some other needs, but um, we're certainly very grateful for the ones that we're able to take care of in this next uh, FY15 budget. Um, I'm also very grateful to work with such uh, an interesting, dedicated, and committed school committee. Uh, that also speaks to the previous members on this committee I've worked with, uh, as well as the administrators, the faculty, the staff. And I have to say, um, I'm impressed with the student body. I think we have very well-behaved, very intelligent, very active students in our schools. And it's a pleasure to see them moving into the uh, 21st century with the education we're able to provide here and on to other things. So I'm pleased that it appears as though um, Northampton has turned a corner, that we are looking in terms of um, being able to provide um, more reasonable educational, meet more reasonable educational needs of our students. And um, I think that with your new superintendent, um, you're on a good road. And I couldn't be more delighted. And I do appreciate having had the opportunity to uh, work with you for this year. And uh, I'll be around for a couple more months. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Scott, who might like to lead us through this. Um, after the superintendent's report page, um, we have this is essentially the same thing we did all over the last meeting. We just kind of put in some graphs and charts and things to help supplement some of the information here. But we uh, we have the same overview that we saw the other day, which details the amount of growth that we had, the eight hundred fifty-six thousand dollars of growth. Um, you should bear in mind that in future years, your Level services budget, all things being equal, is really with almost two and a half percent. So I mean that's something to hold in the back of your minds that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why that line is there. About five hundred twenty-eight thousand dollars was what we needed to to provide a level services budget. And then again, we talked about the things that were uh, added to it down to the bottom, above and beyond that, uh, to get us up from the five hundred twenty-eight thousand dollar increase to the eight hundred fifty-six thousand. Um, the next page, again, just details um, the budget as compared to um, the current year um, and the different service categories and down the bottom by the different schools. And it spreads it amongst the things that we do as a school. And you can see some things are up and down, and, uh, but overall we're up uh, almost 3.4%. The next page details the two major uh, revolving accounts that supplement the budget, um, school choice and circuit. I knew I was going to miss a typo in here somewhere. Circuit, that way, but, um, circuit breaker. Um, and again, um, we know where we're at circuit breaker. We had $1,864,000 at the beginning of this current fiscal year. Um, we're projected at this point to take in $1,350,000. We're on course, and it looks like it will probably hold to spend $1,250,000. So our pot of money going into next year that we would use to supplement the budget would be $1.9 million. Um, and this budget calls for $1.6 million to come from the Circuit Breaker Fund, leaving about $327,000. In school choice. Fund. I mean, excuse me, in school choice in that fund. Um, down the bottom is Circuit Breaker. We know we ended uh, or started the year at $382,000. The projected revenue at this point is $546,000. And currently, we are in course to spend uh, $687,000, leaving $241,000. This differs from school choice in that um, 
school choices we're using money in arrears we're collecting money this year using it next year which is again I think that is that is a great way to do it circuit breaker you can't legally do that you need to spend it in the same uh, fiscal year that you receive it so we're going to end this year projected at 241,000 we're going to collect about 550,000 which is more or less what we get every year unless the state comes up with a higher reimbursement rate and this budget uses $570,000, which would leave us uh, $220,000 in the circuit breaker fund. So together, that, that equals about 2.2% of your budget, which is a good, I think, a healthy um, type of uh, monies to have on hand in case unforeseen things should, should arise. And really, these are the, the biggest things, the two, that's why we broke them out, that could help you in the future with these balances left at the end of the year. Following page is uh, a detail of all of our spending. Uh, our budget's $26 million, but we're going to actually be spending $30 million between the use of all these revolving funds and grants. And this just tells you the amount of money that uh, we plan on spending in each uh, grant and revolving fund. Following page is uh, a summary of all of our revolving funds and grants, um, where it's going to be spent, how much, and in what school and for what purpose. Um, I guess you people vote this way, at least the school choice funds later on, so that we have some guidance in the following year to do. But again, we're going to spend, uh, we're planning on spending $1.6 million uh, in that particular fund. The next page is just a, a, a chart detailing our Chapter 70 that Northampton receives as opposed to the appropriation budget or the taxpayer budget. You can see back 10 years ago, um, chapter 70 accounted for roughly a third of the budget back in 19 uh, I mean 2005 and as you fall across your budget steadily been going up but your revenue I mean your chapter 70 revenue has been straight lining and um, 10 years later you can see that it's roughly a quarter so in 10 years we've lost that that margin over time as compared to your budgets I have a question. Are those, are those, those are the numbers as they were. These are not adjusted for inflation. No, these are actual numbers. The next page is just a summary off the internet from the state. They, they detail all the different calculations they use to come up with your uh, foundation budget and your required school spending. And you really have to be a rocket scientist to get behind some of these things. Um, and we couldn't prove a lot of these things anyway. It's like per capita income and things are based here and your, your valuations and and uh, it's really a lot behind the scenes that make up this easy simple looking graph but anyway it just it shows we're in compliance Northampton does pretty well uh, spending on their schools and so basically in a nutshell your chapter 70 revenue only goes up year to year by what it has to go up which is $25 a, a student really is what it's been the last several years so that's your growth of seventy thousand dollars in chapter 70 is because it's everyone got twenty five dollars a student uh, the next pie chart just uh, it, it shows in chart form where your money comes from to fund the 15 uh, budget um, up top special enti spent entitlement grant is a one of our bigger grants it's two percent all the other grants combined is about two percent school choice is about six percent Circuit breaker is 2%, and other revolving funds added together is about 2%. And down the bottom, you can see your appropriation, the money you need from your taxpayers in, in Northampton accounts for about 86% of the budget. And then there's some enrollment data that follows um, a lot of history going back to 1994. Um, these are October 1st enrollments here. and um, it's interesting that you really held steady here compared to a lot of uh, districts around us that have really declined in population, student population. Done pretty well here. You're, you're in the $3,000 range, give or take a couple hundred students um, every year for the last uh, 20 years. And down the bottom, it details what grades these kids uh, are here. And, uh, and you can see that you're just basically level very close to it here. The next page is a summary of your school choice um, receiving and sending, which you also do very well here. Um, this gives you, since 2005, uh, the number of full-time equivalent pupils um, that were coming in here, and it, 
and the tuition that's associated with them and again that's why we're able to offset six percent of your budget uh, with the revenues that come in from uh, school choice over these years that's an average of a uh, million two hundred and fifty five thousand dollars of income on the incoming side and uh, an average of four hundred and fifteen thousand dollar outgoing so you do very very well here um, charter schools and it's really I think a lot to do with your location more than anything else and you've got some good charter schools around here um, we spend about 1.7 million dollars or the city does um, to fund the charter school tuitions um, but the excess over here I mean that, that covers about half of it and that's still very good that's a lot better uh, I've seen in the graph to the right that that shows you that the, the uh, tuitions of incoming and outgoing I've seen that totally reversed where the, the high number on the chart is, is the outgoing and the low ones the incoming. So that's a good gap here, you do very well. Um, the next one is the projected enrollment that um, this budget is based on. Um, and again, it's by school and by grade and it, it's best guess as of uh, this date right now. Um, in fact, it just came off the, uh, off the uh, computer a couple days ago. You see that we're planning on about two, uh, 2,771 students coming in. And then it's just a line item budget that follows the same one that we had before. Um, and again, there's been no changes to that. And um, and again, it, it just ties with everything else into the front of the $26 million budget, the taxpayer budget in the end. Be happy to answer any questions? I have a question. Mr. Ball. Um, uh, thank you. On Bridge Street Elementary School, um, on the projected enrollment in grade five, it says that there's three sections and then it lists two sections. Is that just something I'm missing or something that's just been was an error? I don't know. No, um, it's not an error. Okay, so. This is next year's, don't forget. It's next year's, not this year. That's right, but I still only see two sections there. So that's why I was three wondering. three sections, 24, 24. Four. Right up here in the corner. That's why I was just. Currently, what's projected are two sections of 24 in each classroom. Right, and I see a three section. Okay. That's what I was just wondering. I see. Yeah. Could be a type. It's right. Could be a type. Oh, and that's fine. Yep. Okay. Just want to clarify mm -hmm. that I'm understanding it correctly. Okay, thank you. Other questions about, uh, about the budget? So, one of the I guess for my, my one of my questions is for the actual vote itself. Uh, are you is the vote on the overall number? Is the vote on the? Um, I guess I just want to ensure when we do have the vote. I want to be clear. Is it this? Um, I, I'm just trying to understand how you want to frame it. Anywhere that we've dealt with that we voted the appropriation. Vote. Total appropriation. Exactly. Okay, good. I, that's why I just want to clarify. Because the other one, really, you have the authority within your own group to do it, and it doesn't need to be approved by anyone along the line. Okay. Ms. Minnick. So if we're voting the appropriation number, then that does not include the school choice funds that are in this budget. Is that correct? My understanding, and again, I've only been here a short time, is that you voted the appropriation budget and then you gave us guidance through a vote of school choice I so know I know in the past when it hasn't been part of the original budget we have taken a specific vote on if we need to add some so if we get three new special education out of district placements yes we vote then to put some uh, school choice funds toward that or toward utilities or whatever it is I'm trying to remember if we vote if do we take two votes one for appropriation and one or are we approving the bottom line of this budget rather than how much the appropriation is? So I, I think, re so we're not approving, I don't know if that's what that means when you say we're approving the appropriation budget. It means exclusive of grants and other stuff, but I don't want to say we're approving how much the appropriation <coughs> line is from yeah. you. We're approving the budget the that's budget. been presented, the mm -hmm. total bottom line. Okay. Mm -hmm. I would hate to have you grants for next year are up in the air. I'd hate to right. have you tie in a number yeah, where right. these grants are up and down and you wouldn't know what you're Which is what I'm saying. So when you say if we, if you make a motion to approve the appropriation budget, it's exclusive of grants. But I just wanted to know if we were approving his number 
that he's giving to us or whether we're approving the budget, which also includes some school choice spending. So I'm asking what the right terminology is to approve a bottom line budget of this amount. <laughs> just approve it as um, presented? <laughs> need a number I just don't know how to yeah I was I, my only question was just about the specificity of the vote in terms of then the flexibility yeah so we're not approving rates. the various yeah, exactly. line, uh, line, 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 line right yeah not, right. definitely not line items yeah probably not even by 2,000 4,000 accounts we're approving the total bottom line number yeah. okay so are we approving the 26,000 in the proposed FY 15 budget requests is that what we're proposing from the front page? Yeah. 20, I mean, that's what I meant. 26 million 364. That's the one that we are approving from the front page. That's what we've always used to do. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. So even though ultimately it's 30 and you had said that what we're going to yeah. move to approve. Okay. Because again, I think it would tie us into these grant numbers. Right. If you right. went to the 30 million. So these may or may not happen. So can I make the motion sure. to approve the budget? Okay, please do. I'd like to make the motion to approve the proposed FY15 budget request. Uh, um, do you need the exact figure? The 26364146 as presented. Second. Okay, so there's now a motion on the table and seconded uh, to approve the uh, proposed FY15 budget request. Is there any more discussion or debate? I just want to just note as one of the <coughs> One of the areas of spending that's that's been declining uh, by over five percent over the past six or seven years <coughs> has been professional development. So, to see the increase in professional development of twenty nine percent is very heartening. I think yeah. it makes a significant impact for for our staff, and then that of course follows through to the students. So, um, as well as we've we've addressed the previous school committee meetings our need to move our technology capacities forward both at the building level and in the classroom and again if you look at this budget there's significant investment made in those areas so again that's a sign of a healthier budget than we've looked at in a long time Ms. Minnick this may have been done at the last meeting which I missed I apologize but I really just want to thank you for coming in and creating something that's understandable and with almost no <laughs> no time and no background thank you for your commitment to that I appreciate thank it. you again okay. any other comments or discussion okay so um, I'm actually gonna ask for a roll call vote yes yeah. Hi. Yes. 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 Okay. Excellent. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is a discussion uh, regarding the, uh, this is the continued discussion, the VersaTrans Late Start proposal, as well as an update on the ridership study from Mr. Meyer, as well as a scheduled vote uh, seeking a revision of the June 13, 2013 NHS Late Start decision. So uh, I will turn this over to superintendent all right um, my thought on this is the fact that we really looked at the ridership um, we looked at the final report on Versa Trans at the last meeting um, mr. Meyer also had some suggestions with regard to ridership information and I thought that we needed to revisit those items as well as to look at um, the directive that you gave to the superintendent last June uh, before you had high school transportation um, back in the budget in terms of um, late start. So I have um, talked with Mr. Meyer and I think he's ready to give you an update with regard to the information he started presenting at the last meeting. Um, so at the last meeting I, I discussed the need to determine how many riders were actually on the buses as opposed to how many passes are issued and talked about 
potential means for determining that. Um, as in many cases, low tech may be the best tech here. Um, given the difficulty of installing equipment on buses, um, because they have to be secured so they don't become missiles in the event of a collision, um, it seems like using manual counts by the drivers when they're loading students in the loop and then if they're coming in the morning when they're letting students off in the loop um, is something that I met with Joy Winnie um, recently a couple of days ago and went down and spoke to the manager down at the Durham Maintenance Center and they're willing to do that and so we could get data on how many students are in the seats and bring that to you so that we could consider how we might make our system more efficient um, so we're ready we're ready to go ahead with that if, if that's the committee's pleasure um, in, in considering this there will be no free lunch in that we may find one of the considerations is we may find that our buses are not full however <coughs> if we consolidate routes the routes become longer um, you have to drive the same number of miles with fewer buses and it's simple division and of course one of the things we've always dealt with is that you have not enough time between the different tiers of school um, you know we have 25 minutes between our high school and our middle school right now in the morning and 55 minutes between the middle school and the um, elementary school that's kind of the relaxed routes in the afternoon it's a half hour between the two tiers so even if we found that we could improve efficiency by consolidating routes because we have the spaces, we then run into the fact that we now have to stretch out the times between the tiers. So um, I think that the committee will have to be cognizant of that when we go forward with this. Just, just to comment just on that, it not only is it a half an hour between the high school and the middle school, but actually in terms of the routes, the drop-off time at the high school is half an hour before the high school opens. So actually it's closer to, it's very, it's, it's very nearly symmetrical in terms of the amount of space between the high school route, the JFK routes, and the elementary routes. It's right. And in, in looking at the data we were provided from the limited snapshot that we took in the fall, our longest high school route is now 39 minutes. So were we to decide as a committee that we would add riders or combine elementary and high school students we might have a route upwards of 45 50 minutes and again that that's something we would have to consider whether we're willing to do it and whether the community would accept that as as a real transportation solution for students or you'd have another issue which well, would be you could let you could you make longer walks to stops for the high school kids right. which doesn't it shortens it keeps the route from getting longer but it doesn't it doesn't shorten the amount of time that student has to spend in terms of their transportation because they have a walk that's right. longer. So. so from that, I think that the, the committee took a vote mm -hmm. last June and directed the superintendent to implement a later start time to be between 8 a.m. and 8.30 a.m. with that time to take effect no later than September 2014. That vote was taken at a time when high school transportation was going to be discontinued. After the override passed, as we all know, this committee voted to bring back high school transportation. The situation we're now in is that we have directed the superintendent to do something, but we've just voted a budget that provides no resources to do it. So I think at this time, the committee has to recognize that we are in a new place it probably would have been best for this committee to recognize that on the day that we returned high school busing um, rather than think wishfully that somehow we would find a solution that didn't require resources. I think at the end of the day, we're going to have to spend more money if we want to add this. It's like everything else in our budget. If we want to provide more teachers in smaller class sizes, we spend more money. If we want to have better technology, we have to allocate the resources. And, and as you've just seen, um, if you look at the list of things that we spent the additional three hundred twenty-six thousand dollars on, um, about a third of it was statutory, statutorily required. We have no option, and the rest were things that were absolutely must-haves for the district. 
So I think that the committee is going to have to address that going forward. If we want this, we're going to have to take the money from somewhere else, um, even if we find some way to make things more efficient. So um, with that, I would, I would offer a motion that we amend our previous vote, our previous um, previously passed proposal to direct the superintendent to gather further information for revising the transportation system for the Northampton High School to allow start time to be between 8 a.m. and 8.30 and to report to this committee as soon as that data is available for us to take further action. Second. Okay. Uh, Mr. Shum. What's, what's your sense of how long of a time window we're looking at? Um, well, discussing it with, with Joy Wenny, who has a lot of experience in planning transportation for this district, and the, the manager at Durham, um, I was asking them, we're looking, we're really looking for peak ridership, and when does that occur? And it was the considered opinion of both of them that it's not springtime. Okay, once the weather improves, once high school kids who are now aging into getting their driver's licenses, once spring sports start, that definitely the data that we would gather now, and we may, you know, we may pilot it just to make sure we're getting accurate data between now and June, um, that's not what we're looking for. Most likely, it's going to be in the fall. Um, it's going to be after the time change when all of a sudden it becomes dark outside, and it could be when the weather gets bad, once the, you know, once the roads become icy and parents decide they don't want their you know, beginning drivers to be going back and forth to the schools. So I would, I would hope that by February or March, we would have that peak data. And again, it's up to this committee whether to decide that, because it's this committee that's going to make a decision based on that peak ridership data. So, just as a follow up, because you said something else that I found very interesting. You said you might do a pilot this spring to see if you're getting accurate data. Right. So, you're going to have the drivers count, right? And then, how are you going to know you're getting accurate data? We're going to have to have somebody stand and watch. Watch the watchers. Also, we can pull. We can pull. We can pull the video. Okay. Right. Again, there's there's continuous videotape, which this committee again has. I mean, the easy way, the easy way is low tech is to have someone with a clipboard standing at a bus loop. Again, we don't, you don't have to count every bus in order to do quality control and data. You just have to do a sample. Um, again, the, you know, the advantage of technology is it's automatic and once you're sure it's working, it only breaks down as often as the technology breaks down. The advantage with having the drivers do it is that it's the least expensive solution, but if the drivers, you know, if the drivers decide that they're going to not do it on a particular day, then you don't have the data for that day. Again, if you miss a few days, that's fine. You, you, know, you never have 100% accuracy in any data collection mechanism. Um, but in our, you know, my discussion with the manager at Durham, it didn't seem to him that it was going to be anything more. I mean, they already have their drivers do a tremendous amount of, you know, they do their circle checks at the end. They do a tremendous amount of work over and above just driving the kids back and forth. This would just be another part of it. And, and we thought that were this introduced to the drivers in fall when their training is going on, that it would be something that they would then integrate into the normal routine of the day. But, you know, for me, I, I just think if, I, if I'm gathering data, I want, it, I want to check it. I want to do some, oh, I I want agree, to do some, I want to do some quality control. I just uh, want, yeah, I was, want to make sure. I think we need that as well. Yeah. Other comments? Ms. Duvall? Yes, I have a comment to make. Um, one of the concerns that we have now is that the, um, the high school <coughs> bus service wasn't taken into consideration, but it was taken into consideration. Um, that was the concern one of the members, namely me, had that day and put forth a motion that we postpone the vote until July. And I think that perhaps this quote, a person who wants to do something will find a way, a person who doesn't will find an excuse. Well, even though I was hoping that we would vote in July once we knew everything, I was assured by the other members that it was being taken into consideration and that the, the point was to still make the vote. So what I'm saying is that 
basically the motion didn't pass to wait until July. We took that into consideration and whether rightly or wrongly so, it, the vote was made and um, I, I think that in the integrity, whether it was late at night, whether it was, you know, we didn't know if the override passed. We knew that we didn't know if the override passed. We should have waited. We should have passed my motion, <laughs> but seriously, we should have waited until we had it, but I don't think that it's right now to call foul that we didn't do it because we didn't have, the, you know, it's not right because we didn't have the information when we knew we didn't have the infor information and we even took a vote on whether or not having that information was important enough to vote for first. Anyway, so. I mean, I, Mr. Meyer, I recognize that there, there were different ways to reach where we are now, but for me, we, we still have a directive and it's a directive for which no resources have been provided. We could have, you know, we could vote that the superintendent should implement class sizes at Northampton High School no greater than 10 students. But we just voted on the budget. And nobody raised the issue of maybe we shouldn't spend money for technology, maybe we shouldn't spend money for additional occupational therapists or speech language you know, pathologists. Nobody raised those issues. So for me, we need to as a responsible school committee address where we are and if no one was willing to reallocate money then we need to recognize that that having again members of the community are looking at that previously passed vote and wondering why we're not acting on it so for long for so long as it stays out there unamended then I think they have an expectation and if we're not doing that as a school committee, then we need to make an amendment, which is what I proposed. Mr. Moore? Yeah, you know, I mean, it's fairly obvious that we don't have, at the moment, a viable plan for a later start time at the high school. Um, I, you know, again, that can be for a variety of different reasons. I mean, you know, we, we, the vote happened, and then this, this, this past winter, we were presented with the first proposal which was actually a proposal that had been pretty routinely dismissed the year before. Um, so that was kind of a wasted half of a year in terms of making any progress. Um, we're just now really starting to get serious about finding out how many people we actually transport on buses. So that's some more time that I think could have been spent better, would have been better earlier. But we're here now and we don't have a plan. Um, I think the other thing to keep in mind about a later start for high school is, is how um, is what it means. The, the 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 educational benefits for teenagers of, versus, of the difference between an early start and a later start is on a par with the difference between being taught by highly ineffective teachers and being taught by effective teachers. That's a pretty big difference. Um, the benefit additionally, you know, think about this too. We have you know, an achievement gap. We have various subgroups, generally speaking, would be considered disadvantaged students who do much worse than other students. The primary beneficiaries of a later start time are teenagers who are on the wrong end of that achievement gap. They derive a great, much greater benefit. In other words, when they look at a whole school and, every, and the average moves up that much, most of that is by people who are on the bottom moving up more than the people at the top. And there's a bunch of reasons for that, most of which you can sort of figure out. Um, so it's a pretty important thing. It's not like a distraction from our main mission of education. It's actually, it, 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 it's something that can change the education of our students as much as, as if we had changed our, had a bunch of highly ineffective teachers and made them into effective teachers. So it's a big deal. And we need to really take it seriously, and it needs to be taken seriously. And I, and, um, and, I, and I think that's, I think, another thing to keep in mind as we sort of go forward with this is that it's, that it's not sort of kind of optional in, 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 in the same ways. It's not, it's not a tweak or something. It's actually a, a big deal. Um, and uh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to, um, I'll send to everybody on the committee and I'll send a copy to um, the central office so if somebody in the public wants to find out what I sent to all of you, they can. Um, of just one article that for me, has links to a whole bunch of studies, but it's essentially a summary of studies 
um, that makes a lot of these points. And, and it's been pretty influential in my thinking in terms of going from thinking, yeah, that might be a good idea, but you know, what else can we afford? To really, it looks in terms of at the cost effectiveness of it compared to other interventions. Um, it's a very cost effective one, precisely because it doesn't require changing a whole lot of people. It, it's just scheduling. It's like what they do at Wendy's, you know? So, um, so I'll send that to everybody. Um, and, and in general, I, I think it's pr really good for us to keep that as, we have a lot of policies. You were talking about how we have policies that aren't acted on. We have a number of policies that haven't been acted on. If you read through the policies, we, we haven't achieved a lot of our policies. Um, that doesn't mean they're bad policies. Um, it means that maybe we need to pay more attention to achieving them. Uh, and I, so I think having a, changing this policy from having a set date to having um, sort of a, what would be like a benchmark of we will get some more data so we can be discussing some more real figures and less hypothetical figures and then revisit the question of a later start time I think is a very reasonable policy. Um, uh, Ms. Nyker and then Mr. Meyer, then I know the superintendent wanted to have a comment. Um, I tend to agree with um, at least part of what Howard said about the looseness of the motion. Um, I think we, or this prior school committee directed the superintendent to do the late start and to implement it. To then change that to a motion that directs the superintendent, and, and I didn't get to write the whole thing down, which is, um, I, I need to really understand exactly your motion some more. but. Um, it seems very loose and without deadlines and without benchmarks. And I think that's important. I think it's important for people who are um, in the public who are very committed to this. And um, it's important that we keep, that we keep a benchmark of where we're going um, and where we're headed. So, I guess what I would propose is that we not vote on a specific motion tonight or that we mull over some different language to the currently proposed motion. So, Mr. Meyer. So I'm in, I'm in full agreement with Howard on where the research stands now and I also have read about the fact that it that this is not a choice between student achievement and late start time that it will benefit those students who right now I mean something we can't say oh we want to close the achievement gap or we can change the start time I mean the, the closing the achievement gap is one of our priorities in the district it's a persistent problem but this might actually help to do that um, I, I'm teaching in high school right now that has the luxurious start time of 7.45. Now the students arrive on the buses around 7.15, 7.20. Um, some of them get up, get on their buses at 5.30 because they're coming from more distant towns. And I can tell you, teaching first period classes, those students are zombies, many of them. I mean, they're very, very quiet and not in a good way. So I think that the district has to take seriously that this would benefit a lot of students, not all, because we know that this is a normal distribution and that there are early birds who are great with getting up at 4.35 o'clock. Um, but I think it would be a significant benefit. In terms of specific timelines, I can tell you the specific date that this needs to be done by. It needs to be done by the proposal of the budget because this is going to cost money. That's, I mean, as a school committee, to be taken seriously, we need to when, when the budget is presented, when budget priorities are presented to us by the superintendent, if we believe in this, that's when we need to say this line item for the additional teacher to reduce class size at JFK, we want to use that for busing. World language at JFK, we want to use it for busing. It's not going to be easy. And so I think as, as far as taking responsibility, that's what we did previously was we voted and we told the superintendent to do something and then we never came back to it, which I think is a way of avoiding responsibility. I mean, we set a very specific time for the superintendent and set nothing for ourselves. 
So I would just, you know, in terms of my vote as a, a committee member in proposing this motion, um, I will flag next year's budget discussions. If we have the data and we don't want to spend the money, then this won't happen until we recognize that we're going to spend a few, you know, minimum $100,000, then we're not serious as a school committee about making this initiative happen. So um, just to, are you, pro are you willing to put a date certain, or do, do you, are you receptive to the idea of putting a, at least a time frame in for the um, data collection or I? <coughs> I, again, I don't want to. My motion was to was to direct the superintendent to to collect the data and come up with uh, you know revised strategies for transportation to reduce transportation cost. Because I only want to ask the superintendent. The superintendent doesn't vote on the budget. We do. So I can't I can't direct I can't as a school committee member direct the superintendent now on next year's budget. That's up to us during next year's budget season. So that's why, from my perspective, what I'm asking the superintendent to do as an informational request as a school committee member is, please give me the information that might allow us to come up, to know what that number is, to know what that dollar amount will be next budget season. And I don't think, I don't think we had a handle on it going into the budget season. By the time we got the Versatrans study back and we looked at the cost figure, the budget process was far enough along that none of the members of budget and property um, could recommend at that point allocating money for this transportation change. So do you mean that part of your motion, or you're saying that we need the information by the time of the budget. I think that we need the information long before that so that we can make an educated decision. I don't think we can wait until the month of the budget being voted on to have that information. Well, the information is going to come in as it comes in. I mean, as the sheets come off the bus, they can be emailed to you. That's, that's easy. It's just what we're looking for is we're looking for peak ridership. No, I, and I, guess I totally get what you're saying, but I, I just think that the fact that nothing's been done since this was voted on to me is indicative of what could happen again. Mm -hmm. And I so I really don't want to not have any timelines in. I, I want to hold our feet to the fire. I'm not saying I don't agree with the ridership. I'm not saying I don't agree with some of your um, idea, but I think we need to hold our feet to the fire. I'm amenable to any amendment that you know. If you want to, uh, if you want to suggest specific I dates, I just. Think uh, I think the superintendent wanted to add right. something. Yeah, you know it's interesting because uh, this study and this interest has been going on for a number of years, and I really want to clarify that neither myself nor any of the other administrators disagree with the research. And indeed, I think all of us feel if we could do this tomorrow, we would, because the research is very clear on it, and it would make a difference. The problem we run into is the issue of money and the number of cuts you've had to make in the recent years. I think, indeed, Mr. Meyer is absolutely correct. To solve this problem is going to take money. And you need to set your priorities. And if indeed this is a priority, then you have to put money toward it. Because it's not going to go away. And it's not going to get any better. And you have to find the money to do it. The research that I think that will come out of this will only support the fact that, yes, you have fewer kids on certain days riding the bus. But as Mr. Meyer explained, if you're going to combine routes, you're going to extend the time the kids are on buses. And that's one of the things you can look at. Is that going to make the significant difference to do it? I doubt it very much. But at least you'll have some hard data and you can look at it again. I do think when you're looking at the data, you've got to have the winter months included in there. and You've got to balance it when, when you do your budget. So I would think if you collected data through February vacation period, that would get you through the worst part of the winter, which is when most kids are riding the bus because <coughs> their parents, even if they drive, don't necessarily want them driving in winter weather. So I think that would do it. I also want to clarify that um, I don't think nothing was done with this. Uh, I've put in many hours. Previous business manager put in many hours this year, as did the transportation director. We had all the administrators involved in this at three or four different extended meetings trying to come up with the best offer we could make 
and we did that and we presented it. It was not what we wanted, it was what we could come up with. Same situation as now. You've got a study, it shows that you could do this, but in order to do it, it's either going to cost you money and or you're exchanging a bad situation with another group of kids. You should not be pitting parents and children against each other in terms of who's going to go first to school. And the theory that, well, the little kids can suffer now because eventually in high school they'll be fine, doesn't cut it. And I think you have to look at the fact that as administrators, we have to be concerned about all the kids, not just some of the kids. And I know that there are a lot of passionate people out there. And I don't disagree with the research at all. I disagree with the fact that we're going to penalize one group for another group. And I don't think <coughs> that's the way to do the plan. So I think that Downey has something here that will work in terms of getting the additional information get it by February vacation time. That gives you time to look at your budget, it gives the administration time to look at the budget, and then the ultimate decision is the school committee. But it's going to cost you some money to do this project. The other point that I'm not sure people have thought about is the whole issue of regionalization of a late start time. I know that the collaborative might be a place for the superintendent to start talking about this to see if there's any interest on the part of other superintendents. Because it'd be a lot easier to do this if we did it across several school districts. Because you're not then running into the issues around um, sports, other activities, et cetera, et cetera. So I would think that bringing this up and discussing it in those arenas might also hold some promise. The only other school district I know locally who have looked at this is Amherst. Um, Perhaps there are others and I just don't know it. So I think that that's a forum to bring it up as well. But I think that the important part is you're getting the data, you're looking at it, you can make a decision with your next budget, and at the same time, you're buying yourself some time in terms of establishing a relationship with your new superintendent. This is not something that the new person coming in should be spending hours on at the beginning of the term of being a superintendent here. It's gone through five superintendents. So this, I think, does two things. It buys a little time so that you can establish that sort of relationship, and he can concentrate on the other things that need to be done immediately. You're getting the data, and then you can make a decision as to what you want to do with your next budget. So I support what, what Mr. Meyer is looking to do this evening. So, Ms. Anna? Um, so I agree that I, I like that, um, Mr. Meyer. That you, we have to be able, to, we have to be willing to commit money to this, because I think what the what the ridership study is going to tell us is that we need more buses, we need more routes, we're going to need to decide that this is important enough, and I think it is important enough to warrant having more money go towards it. Um, it's impacting wellness. Um, it's you know by by keep by dragging this on and on, we're really saying to students. Well, your wellness actually isn't that important. Mm -hmm. And that, I really think, is the most important thing um, to be promoting. And I think, that, I think that we need a firm deadline to say, yes, we're going to decide before next year's budget what, what we're doing with this and how many dollars we're going to set aside to actually make this happen. So does the February, I don't know what, would that be like the 15th of February? I yeah, mean, we could just, uh, so the 15th, so with the 15th of February, could that, would you amend your motion to put some kind of, you know, data to be, to be fi final data analysis to be presented? Um, again, I'm, I'm amenable to any amendment recognizing that this, that this committee could rescind or modify. Yep. Again, the responsibility will come at the budget season. Okay. We, and I'm absolutely fine with putting in February 15th if that gives us sufficient time to get the winter ridership data and gives us time to incorporate it into next year's budget deliberations. But the responsibility will come back to us next budget season. And if, and as 
as Hannah said, if we're not if we're not willing to step up and allocate resources because this is important enough that we're that we're going to give the resources, um, then we can take all the votes we want, but not, nothing will change. Okay, Mr. Shuffle. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, it, I, I like the idea of getting more data. I'm, I'm a data guy. I like that. But I don't see how we're not dropping this on the next superintendent's lap. Because it's not just going to be a matter of, well, we're going to get a count, and then in February 15th, we're going to be able to figure it out. Because we're still going to have to go through, I'm, I'm guessing, one process would be essentially the same process that we just went through, which is we're going to get accurate numbers, we hope. And then we're going to say, all right, well, what's the most cost efficient routing that we're going to have? Then we're going to have to go, I'm assuming, we're going to have to engage in another contract with Versatrans because we don't have the in-house expertise to do that. And I know that we're doing this in the idea of being transparent, which I like, but there is always going to be somebody out there who's going to say, well, you didn't look at it this way, and or you gave the wrong numbers, or, or whatever else it is. So, um, so, so that bothers me, and I don't think I have a completely airtight solution, but I will, oh, the, the other part of this is, as we go into it, we, we also, you know, there's going to be a budgetary impact, obviously, and I think it's great that we're going to be, you're, you're making the suggestion, we've got to sit here and say, yeah, we know we're going to spend money on it. Um, but I want to throw a suggestion out there and say, do do we say now, and we're picking a number out of thin air, but we throw a number out there and say, if it exceeds this, we're, we can't we can't do it. We're not comfortable with that. You know, is it $800,000? Is it $20,000? I have no idea, but, you know, it's all about prioritization, as we know. And, and with all due respect to your point about how it's not optional, everything is optional because we just said professional development for years. We cut, cut. We didn't no, have. What it. I meant, what I tried to say, was it's not, it's not trivial. I, I, okay, it's that, not like it's not yes, like choosing I, the color of I the agree. band. I agree. I agree. And none of this, none of the stuff that we talk about yeah. is trivial, but it all right. becomes down to the prioritization. So, I guess it's just what, what I'm most uneasy about is the idea that we're going to go forward with this, and we really have no idea what the number is going to be. Uh, because we don't know what the plan is going to be. And I guess I might be more comfortable if we talked a little bit about saying, well, what's the number that we might be able to work in there? I, I think that's why the study is so important. I don't think we have that information. And I think, um, first of all, I want to apologize if I in any way offended anyone with the comment that, we, that nothing's been done. I, I certainly didn't mean that nothing's been done by anyone. There has not been discussion by the school committee to implement the vote. Um, I think only with accurate ridership numbers are we going to know how much it's going to cost. I think to set an amount now that we're only willing to spend $100,000, I don't know that I can vote on a number without knowing, okay, if we do this, this is what it's going to cost. <coughs> Because different things are going to cost different amounts, different ways. The hub, you know, one system may cost the one amount, one another system may cost another amount. I mean, I, so what I'm also saying is this is going to take a lot of analyzing. This isn't just going to take here's how many riders are riding these buses and here's how much it's going to cost. We're then going to, or someone, or, and I don't know if that's Versa Trans or if we need Versa Trans, but we need to then analyze that data and say, okay. Do we want to implement a certain system, and how much will that certain system cost? And so I guess that's why I'm saying we need more time than in order to figure out what's the plan, and only then can we figure out what the plan's going to cost. So when you say more time, you're suggesting back it up from February 15th. No, no or I think the February vacation is fine. Oh, okay. I, I think that's fine. I think that's reasonable, um, and. I'm not sure that it's going to give us 100% accurate data because it is kind of in the beginning to middle stages of the winter, but I think it's the best we're going to be able to do. We'll probably have a warm winter next year and <laughs> be sitting here saying, well, we don't really know what the percentage of ridership is. I mean, I think um, Superintendent Nash has said before, like, we're not going to, we're never going to turn someone away because they decide that this is the day out of the month that they're going to ride the bus. I mean, I think we have to still really consider who has bus passes, and then if you have a bus pass, you have a right to have a seat on the bus. Mr. Fall? I would agree entirely with Ms. Hannah, but I've also been in a situation where more than the 
a lot of number have been on the bus. And it's been because of a um, central office or whatever, and yet we accommodated, and that's what happened that day. I don't think that we should, I mean, if it happens every once in a great while, it's different than if it's an ongoing issue, first of all. And second of all, February 15th, if we, our meeting will be February 12th. So if we wanted to discuss it at the meeting of February 12th, maybe we can cut it off before then. Just an idea. Okay. Um, that's a regular school committee meeting. Right. What we did this year and what I suspect you'll do next year is you'll put a special budget meeting in. Right. The end of February and another one the end of March. Right. But what so I'm saying February 15th would give you time to have the numbers ready because you wouldn't meet probably until the 26th, 27th, something of that nature of February. Right, but if it was by the February 12th and we could have an update was all I was thinking to be able to, just an update as far as just where it's standing. It's three days difference, but whatever. Okay. As long as we do it with integrity, I don't care. Well, again, I would expect the data would be reported to you as it came in. So you, you know, you would have a sense. We'll do it monthly. And daily. Yeah. And again, <laughs> this is one year. Daily. So it's one, it is one year, it is one winter. So right. again, that, what I, what I think that I said to the school committee last time when ag agreeing to try to spearhead this was that if you aren't comfortable with the prospect of doing, of scheduling buses by actual ridership plus some maximum capacity, then we should not collect the data. I mean, if, if, if the majority of this committee thinks that we should have always enough capacity for the number of passes issued, then we shouldn't waste the driver's time, and we shouldn't <coughs> waste our time. And I think it's important that that's a threshold question. <coughs> as far as as far as uh, was like discussion of what's the top number, Ms. Winnie said back when she started Northampton, she had 16 <coughs> buses to work with on each tier. That really cuts your drive. You know, that cuts your times. That means you can telescope the time between different levels of schooling. And you can just multiply fifty thousand dollars times the additional seven buses is three hundred fifty thousand dollars. And you, <coughs> you want to cut it even further to where we can schedule the levels twenty minutes apart. You can just add ten buses and add five hundred thousand dollars plus or minus. So I mean, I think that's what you're you're really looking at as a, as a max. Now, how how closely you could shave it is is that that I couldn't tell you. I just want to. I think I, I, the, the other school in the area that has got a later start time is Holyoke High, and um, they dismiss around when we'd be shooting for. So sometime in that 2:30 zone, and um, and I and I think we all know that they managed to compete in athletics and um, and every and, you know. So I, so I don't I don't know that we need to wait until the bandwagon arrives, nor do I think we you know need to be concerned about being able to schedule athletic competitions. Um, Holyoke High has managed um, for several years now to do it, and I think we probably could too. I, I you know, I, um, I just, um, again, I think it's a, it really is a question of, of trying to figure out how to do it as opposed to sort of seeing reasons why it wouldn't work. Because remember, our current setup pits students against students. Um, you know, we got the letter uh, from the, um, from the administrative leadership team when they were expressing their dismay with the proposal that they presented us with back in uh, December or January, pointing out that that proposal put the elementary students even further late, which was developmentally inappropriate for elementary students. So we're currently upside down in terms of all of our students are at a developmentally inappropriate start time. Um, so I don't, so to sort of say, well, let's just keep the status quo because a change might cause some inconvenience for people. It's like, no, our, our status quo is causing actual detriment to our students. And I think it's really important to recognize that it's, 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 it's going to be worth investing, you know, some, some work into it. I don't, you know, and continued work. I don't, you know, just because the solution doesn't present itself like that doesn't mean it's not something to continue working on. Um, Mrs. Minnick. Okay, I'm going to preface my remarks by saying that, because I, I fear when I say what I'm going to say, I'm going to get just like a, an <coughs> onslaught of emails <laughs> livid with me. Um, Do you want so, the voice changer yeah, or something? Yeah. Let, me, let me just go ahead and say that I 
I agree with what everyone said about the validity of the proposal, the idea that there is compelling evidence that supports doing this. My, but, but sort of in line with your suggestion that there might be a top, a, a dollar limit. I, I just, I, I mean, I wrote this as a joke for Downey, but we just, <laughs> but we just approved a budget for the coming year that includes contractual increases, but also includes some things that, as Downey pointed out, we needed to do, we had to do, whatever. But it was mm -hmm. an increase to our to this year's budget of 3.7%. Is that right? 3.4. 3.4, whatever. So it's not, and the override that was passed was going to get us to maybe three years at about two and a half percent. So we just got some extra money from the mayor. I don't know what, but that means, number one, I don't know how much money he's going to have next year because he's used some of it this year. It also means that our next year's budget is higher, so the percentage increase on that is going to be a bigger dollar amount, so I don't know if it's going to be there. And finally, I don't know what the cost of this is going to be, but my joke says, pick one, late start versus smaller class size, late start versus technology, late start versus building maintenance, late start versus teacher pay increases. I mean, what, what gives? I don't know where we get the money, and I guarantee when we get into this discussion, there's going to be somebody in here saying that they don't want us to increase class sizes in order to fund, even though both of those things contribute to student performance and student well-being and student focus. I, I, we are in an untenable situation, and anyone who's watched these meetings for any number of years knows that Northampton, I, we got the minimum increase from the state in Chapter 70 funding because we do just well enough that we don't get any extra help. So here we are, I, I mean, I, it, we, are, we are in a, a we're in a push-push situation. I mean, there's just no way to figure this out. But my guess is that in order for us to be able to afford this commitment, we're going to have to cut something else. Right. I mean, I think that I'm the paper, so that's the paper a I'm going to send you talks about. It's just about. a caution right, right. that I really think we need to consider that as we're talking about all of this stuff. So it's not that we have a lack of, of commitment Excuse mm -hmm. me, to the concept. It's that we can't figure out how to make it work. Kind of Absolutely. I, I think the paper I'm going to send around talks a little bit about the cost effectiveness of it. Um, and you can sort of see why. That in order to decrease class size in any meaningful way when you have 3,000 students and only <laughs> whatever we have, 200 teachers, you, you know, you, you have to hire a lot more teachers in order to really change the class size, you know, by a number that's bigger than one or two. Um, Whereas the, ske the scheduling change, precisely because it is really just it is really just scheduling, even if it has some costs, changes for all those students m in much more cost effective way. In other words, if for, for example, the high school to hire two more teachers, we're talking a hundred thousand dollars. Two more teachers at the high school will have minimal impact on class sizes, whereas that same hundred thousand dollars, if you could start this high school forty five minutes later would have a positive effect for essentially the entire 900 students. So, so it's so so it's in terms of that same those same dollars because there's no doubt about the class size thing being very effective. The question is at what cost? Likewise, and so I don't think it's these things versus each other. It's it's about trying to figure out how we can spend our money most effectively. But I'm not talking about reducing class size from where it is at a certain amount versus mm -hmm. later start time at the other amount. I'm talking about later start time at the expense of increasing our existing class sizes because we have to lay off some teachers to pay for the transportation thing. And the other thing I would say is that you said that t that the administrators uh, pointed out that to to you do the proposal that they had laid out for us would put elementary kids even further into a time that was not educationally appropriate for them. But to flip everything on its head and make them start at 
is also educationally inappropriate for our youngsters. So I'm not sure. It's ideally everybody would start between 8:30 and 8:30. Yeah, yeah, everybody would start at 8:30, and we, we would did, just we have, have one tier. 25 buses. Which is what we did when we had the one tier. Mm -hmm. Sure. We started yeah. around that would be wonderful. Great. But if we can't afford what we're trying to we do, afford, we really can't afford anything. that. So I mean, I this is this is like. One of those brain teasers that just you just sit there and beat your head on the wall until you get a headache and go away. We're brain builders. <laughs> 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 okay, um, Ms. Duvall and then Mr. Zahal. Well, I, you know, when when Ms. Minnick said, you know, um, late start time versus this and everything else, if, if we replace the late start time with the wellness of all our students versus, then it's just a difference of looking at it. So I think it's just a matter of priorities and, and how important the wellness of all our students are in the whole big scheme of things. So I, I would agree with Ms. Hanna. Mr. Zahowski. I was just going back to a comment that Mr. Moore made. Um, I thought the superintendent brought up a, an interesting um, idea as far as looking to the collaborative to maybe see if we could make this be more of a, a regional type of change. And I'm just going to go back to what um, Mr. Moore said about athletics and uh, using Holyoke as an example. Um, they are making it work, and I, and I understand that part of it is because of how they can run their transportation, but I, I was going to speak to it just at um, the, the point of athletics and how it works after school for kids. The, the way that it works for schools uh, like Hoyo to still compete in the afternoons is to release their students earlier so they can get to the fields and participate with schools that are getting out early. And my concern with that always, not only as a coach, but as an instructor, teacher myself, is students are missing valuable time in the classroom so they can get to an athletic competition. So I go back to the superintendent's uh, suggestion. If we could get it regionalized and the teams with whom we compete are all getting out at the same time, then we could decrease the amount of time students would have to leave early in order to go to these competitions. I think it makes perfect sense, and I'd be happy to uh, see that pursued a little bit more for, if not any other reason than that. Mm -hmm. Except that the start time of competitions can be set later. For example, track meets all start at 4 o'clock. They don't start, we've they don't had start this, as soon yeah. as possible. Yeah. We've had this school. discussion in regards to daylight, right, and especially mm -hmm. in the fall. Mm -hmm. I think you and I have had well, lengthy discussions on this, that there are certain times of the year where it just doesn't work. You right. have to get out there early in order End to of do October. It. Okay, Ms. Duvall. Just to follow up on what Mr. Zahowski said, with missing valuable time in the classroom with being released early, but there's also quite a, a number of students that are missing valuable time in the classroom with not being awake and aware bright and early in the morning, too. So, I mean, there's multiple ways to look at it. I just think that we need to honor our original commitment. Okay. So, I uh, just want to... We had a motion on the table. I don't believe it's been formally amended unless the maker is uh, well, I believe there was an amendment if the, the amendment was offered I don't think, I don't there, think there was, was actually an amendment, amendment offered so they just were asking if if, if you would add you that if you would add I would what, consider well, adding something I guess I need I thought that that was a proposal to add the February 15th date. No, I spoke to that and I can't do an amendment. <laughs> no, no, I thought that there was yeah. another, another person who had suggested it. Gary, I, I, I'm not comfortable making an amendment because I'm not comfortable with, I'm not comfortable enough and know enough the language of the motion that you proposed to make an amendment to that motion. Could you read back the If that makes sense. Motion is. I tried to write it down, but I couldn't write that she fast. Was, well, she was going to call you I was later. Actually, I was actually reading from my previous motion, which I did write down. I tried to write it all down. Because that was in the it minutes. Was too long. Um, I, I was directing, or I guess requesting might be a more polite word, request the superintendent to gather ridership data to allow for analysis of the current transportation, student transportation system. Um, with the goal of improving its efficiency and providing a way to allow change start, start time, time to change start time to eight thirty to, to between eight and eight thirty between eight and eight thirty. And could we add such could, data to be provided by right? Don't worry about add date. something to the end <laughs> that, that the okay. data will be provided okay. by a certain such date. Data to be provided by 
Yeah. On or, on or before. I think my initial motion said at the earliest practicable date. So I did include that, but, but was, say that's not strong right. enough. I mean, again, we're the school committee. We have the ability at every meeting to say, where's our data? Where's our data? Where's our data? And again, that's why I think it's, it's illusory for us to set this date because in some ways you say it holds our feet to the fire, but I, I see in some ways it takes us out of the loop for too long. And we spoke about this as a school committee when we looked at our practices now probably two years ago. One of the things that we said is, how often do we close the decision loop? How often do we ask for information or ask for something to be done, do we come back and revisit it? And if we don't set ourselves a schedule, then we allow ourselves as a school committee to, to not do our job. So we can set the February 15th date, but if we don't discuss it at all, then I think we'll find ourselves scrambling. I think we might be too fixated on the February 15th date. As you said, the date is going to start coming in day one. So, so it can't be, all right, we're done. February, we got all the data February 15th because uh, there's another step that has to happen. So, you know. Maybe updates or something? Well, it's not, I, I don't know, you know, it's whatever, it's going to be up to the superintendent how they figure it out. But, but from the first day, you can start plugging numbers in to the plans that already exist and start figuring out whether or not. Yeah. The superintendent has a, has a suggestion that it could be sent out monthly with the agendas right. and the data. And, and my comment about setting a date was like, an absolute last case scenario. Mm -hmm. I certainly think that this needs to be an ongoing discussion monthly or every other month or however we want to do it. And I think the more discussion, the better. So if that was misunderstood, um, then mm -hmm. my only reason for a date was to say, we have to have everything by this date in order to make an educated decision on the budget. But certainly if we have it before, that would be great. And, and I just want to, I, I agree with you, but I want to make a distinction. There's the data, and then there's the analysis of the data. I don't need to get monthly reports on ridership. I, I don't. You know. <laughs> what I need is to know that the analysis is taking place to see that the plans are going to work. Mm -hmm. no. How well they will, may work. Yeah. Mr. Vaughn. I'd, I'd like to say that I like um, the superintendent's thought on um, just a, a monthly update. Um, with the agenda, I think that that makes a lot of sense. There's there's no problem with sending out a monthly update when we send out the agenda. Right. But Mr. Shaflow is absolutely right. There might be nothing there. It doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. But I have to tell you that from working with this for a year and looking at possibilities, and I know my predecessors did the same, we're not in a position to do the analysis and come up with something other than what we've come up with. Because we've done this six ways for Sunday already. And we know that the cost is there. So if you're looking to change routes, extend the time of routes, which you certainly could do, and if that's your plan, then actually looking again at doing that process is going to take a lot of time. And some of it could be done by joy and some of it cannot. So however you look at this, it's money involved. And the board has to decide how much do you want to spend and where do you want to spend it. Because I can tell you that sitting around a table coming up with something differently than we've already sat around a table and came up with isn't going to work. Mr. Meyer. Um, as, as someone who has discussed this at, at many meetings, and I think that it's important to discuss it, I would, I would not think that having a monthly discussion of this <laughs> is a, is, would be yeah. productive. Yeah. That's why, that's why we, we, being informed of the data as it's coming in to maybe sharpen our thoughts about it um, is, is one thing. But to, to have an agenda item, I think, would be counterproductive. Again, as the superintendent said, this will come down to budget season when we'll make the decision. Um, Ms. Winnie is very good at designing routes. And if we say to her, design the routes as if you had 12 buses, I think she could do it in short order. And she could come out with, here are your 12, here are your 12 buses. This is how it's going to run. This is where I'm going to fit the van pools in. This is where I'm going to fit my three buses in. And, she, and, and this will be the time. These will be your your route times, so this is how far apart the high school and JFK will start. She could do that. She could do that right now. 
Okay, and that's and that's again because if we want if we want to compress if we want to compress the time so that we can allow for instance I just penciled in let's send the middle school at 750 let's send the high school at 820 and then the elementary school at 850 um, those are thin, 30 minute times in the afternoon you know you'd have you'd have to do something creative with the high school because then you're down to not enough time between the dismissal at the high school and the elementary school but again that's that's not something that we need versa transit to because that's keeping our same tier system that's adding buses subtracting buses so again the committee can you know ask for that scenario to be played out and get that information way before the data actually comes in and confirms that we need to do that but but again you'll at the end of the day you're going to be paying for 12 buses instead of nine okay so uh, back to the motion that's on the table, which now has the outside deadline of February 15th in it um, and, uh, and sort of lays out what the course of action is. Is there any further discussion on that or can we vote on the motion? Please vote. Okay. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? I yeah. abstain. Okay, we have one abstention. So the ayes have it. The motion carries. Next item on the agenda is the business manager report. I don't have much for you here tonight. I did pass out a uh, kind of a generic uh, expenditure statement that I think that we've been getting in the past. But I do want to say that I've had time now that the budget has been prepared to go over the current year situation. Um, and we're, we're going to end the year quite comfortably right now. I've projected out all the salaries and everything else. and. Uh, we're not loaded with dough, but everything is on course to go uh, smoothly for towards the end of the year. It's kind of a when the year is three quarters done, you want about two thirds your budget left because of summer salaries and stuff, and that's almost exactly. What we're at here. I know it's a little generic, but I haven't had time to really fine tune it. But I, I do know that uh, it's in pretty good shape. Okay. <laughs> I guess my my question I did have is if. Because I don't know enough about how how things get paid or not paid. If you know some of these things, which are well over what was budgeted, and some which seem to be under what was budgeted, yeah. um, if any of them are, are noteworthy or something we should sort of take into account in future years, or if this is you know just I, I, I went through and looked at these items and. Um, for instance, the one is over thirteen thousand dollars. It was because we hired a lot of interpreters because we didn't have English-speaking students at that time. You know, things that we had a bigger <coughs> influx of that sort of thing. So I think these are really anomalies here, huh? and the big number on the on the back page is really offset by the one under it. This includes all the tuitions that were left at this point in time, um, and there will be a little bit of room to move them into the uh, circuit breaker where you did budget a, a substantial amount this year. So that's a little misleading there. Um, but I think this is what has been passed out previously, so I didn't want to change that in too much. But, right. yeah. but uh, no, I, you know, doing the budget and now being halfway familiar with it, um, I really wouldn't have changed too much here. So this made sense. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Ms. Duvall. Yeah, I have a question about the food services. Um, once again, like Howard said, not knowing how and when things are paid, but. Um, we're already at 100% used, and do we? Are, does that mean we're going to be under? This just over? this subsidizes your revolving fund where the kids pay the money. This is just because that isn't breaking even quite at this point in time. This amount of money here just is a supplement. It gets transferred into that account one lump sum, and uh, that's why it's exact. And it helps. Uh, so we have no more coming out. I mean, that's exactly. That, it just yeah. happens to go. That, that's okay. it. And this uh, is about what you're going to need to balance the whole thing out because it doesn't quite pay for itself. Okay. Because I know that with the with the new health foods and everything else, that the price has gone up. And so I was just wondering. So, okay. Thank you, Mr. Meyer. So I, I just had a question about that last the non-public tuition and the collaborative tuition. So those are actually. Um, those are actually are those actually additional services or are those acceleration of contract payments? Because I understand that this is right. This is t as as expected to be expended to date. Right. So are we actually um, are we actually 
that we contracted for more services? So that's not that's not just that we paid them earlier than expected. No. Um, in fact, the, the second column over is encumbrances. That's it's not really spent yet. Right. When it does, it switches from that column into the one next to it. So th these are the, all the outstanding obligations that we have for these kids that attend those outside schools in total. So it's, like I said, and it looks like a big number, the second one up from the bottom. But it's really offset by the one below it that had a better than expected year. So. And again, this is everything. And it will need to be journaled out at some point in time into the offset is the uh, circuit breaker fund. That's where a lot was budgeted. So. Thank you. Other questions about this uh, report? Okay, thank you. Um, next is personnel report. Any uh, personnel changes or? No, in your, um, in your materials is just a list of the new hires and okay. we, we have added some sec uh, from some substitutes this month as well. Okay. And then finally, the superintendent report. Okay. I do have some items this evening. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the math curriculum at both JFK and um, Northampton High School. Uh, this evening, you did approve the purchase of the textbooks. As you know, the textbooks um, at the high school are about 10 years old, and we're also looking to get math books to correspond with the Common Core. So I want to reiterate that the only thing that's changing in math at JFK is the textbook being used. Uh, we're moving from connected math project to the big ideas. Um, and the reason for doing that is multiple. First of all, it's aligned with the Common Core frameworks, uh, which CMP is not. It's an excellent balance of exploring mathematical concepts and skill practice, whereas CMP was primarily exploration with very little skill practice. Um, there are more resources to support students and parents uh, with homework. Um, the Big Idea has excellent online resources uh, as well as um, the resources for CMP online were very limited. It has an extension of activities for each lesson that are much more rigorous than the ones provided in CMP. It has a better support system for students who are below grade level and it has embedded opportunities for differentiation. So those are the reasons that the math department at JFK um, decided that this was the book that they would go to. Um, when I look at the high school level, um, what we're looking to purchase this year, which you approved this evening, is um, two levels of uh, integrated math, level one and level two. Uh, next year, they'll be looking to purchase the third level. They don't need it this coming year. They'll need it the next year. And they've also, the math department there will also be offering an honors in terms of integrated math two and uh, also an honors for integrated math three. Um, in general, the honors math courses cover the same content as the regular courses but move at a faster pace and go into greater depth, meaning that some additional content is covered at the end of the course that the regular courses, uh, course does not get to do. Um, in addition to that, um, Ms. Wilson and Mr. Lombardi did a great job, I think, in answering questions that parents had of students who this year have eighth grade students. Um, and we put that up on the website as well as sent hard copies home. We did it under something called Frequently Asked Questions. And uh, I did receive some information from parents um, that thought that that was um, a wonderful activity. They really appreciated it and felt that it went a long way to answering their questions. Um, we have not given up the idea that we need to do more work with differentiated instruction, and we're building that now. Um, Ms. Cheever um, was working with me today. We're looking at doing some release time the end of this year once these textbooks are in, and we're also looking to work the summer and into the next semester. So I think that we have the math um, uh, well underway in terms of meeting the needs of all of our youngsters. So I appreciate getting that done this year. Um, park testing, I want to speak to. As you know, we were down to only a couple of schools, Jackson Street being one of them, where we did testing with um, grade five in English language arts. We had a smaller group of children than we initially expected um, who actually took the test. Um, and from all reports, 
kids love it because they get to do it on the computer. Um, so the kids who did take it really appreciated doing it and thought it was you know kind of a fun activity um, because of the technology that was built into it. Um, we still have the sixth graders who will do ELA, but they're not doing that until May. And across the state, there's about 81,000 students participating in the pilot testing. I've also uh, requested a waiver from the Commissioner of Education for the one additional day to be made up at Leeds. I sent that request on April 1st. Uh, I've not heard anything yet. You remember back to December 15th, we had a heating problem and we had to send the kids home at 10 o'clock. Um, my letter indicates that we still have met over um, the time amount. It's 900 hours of student contact time. Um, we've well exceeded that and I did put that in. Obviously, if we have to make up the day, that's additional cost for transportation. Um, so I'm waiting for an answer on that. Um, some good news, the Washington Post, I think even many years, um, Jay Matthews has been doing the Challenge Index in which he's ranking the top high schools across the United States. And it's designed to identify schools that have done the best job in persu persuading average students to take college level courses and test, basically AP. Um, and Northampton is rated as number 15 in the state of Massachusetts. And what I think is impressive about that is in the top 15, there are five private schools, four charter schools, and the other five were the public schools. And we're number 15 in that. So I think that's something we can be very proud of. Um, the Department of Education has approved our district's technology plan through June 30th, 2015. And that's important because we need approval in order to continue to qualify for E-rate discounts and state and federal uh, grants, technology grants. That plan is on the website if anyone wishes to take a look at it. And I would thank Angelo Roto, our director of technology, for getting that done and getting it submitted and approved. And then the best news for last, and that's the district-wide selection of the Pioneer Valley Excellence in Teaching Awards recipients. Uh, I think Northampton has been doing this for maybe six or seven years. And um, based on our student population, we're allowed four teachers to be recognized, with one being a first-year teacher. And these teachers were all nominated by their peers. And um, they will be honored along with Hampshire, Hamden, and Franklin County teachers. Our group will um, be honored at the Log Cabin on May 6th. And our teachers are I apologize in advance for mispronouncing the name. Um, our first uh, new, year, uh, new teacher this year at JFK Middle School in Social Studies is Daniel Harrisay, I hope. Is that how you say it? No. Close. Close, okay. Um, at the high school, we have Melissa Power Green, and she's our special education teacher in the Alternative Learning Program. Also at JFK Middle School, we have Tim Levy, who's a um, math teacher there. And at Jackson Street School, we have Paula Welchman. So those are the four teachers being honored this year. And that's all I have unless you have questions. Any questions for the superintendent regarding her report for this evening? Okay, so we'll now um, move into, we have no new business scheduled. Um, just note that our future business and meeting dates, our next school committee meeting is scheduled for May 8th, 2014 at 7.15 p.m. here at JFK Community Room. Uh, finally, we have uh, an executive session uh, scheduled, uh, and I would ask that uh, someone um, make a motion to move into executive session, and I would ask that that motion include the uh, text of uh, as it's written on the um, on the agenda okay can I make sure All right, I move that we move into executive session in the JFK's principal conference room under Massachusetts general law open meeting chapter 30 a section 21 a to conduct to conduct contra contract negotiations with non union personnel namely the superintendent whereas an open session would have a detrimental effect on the school committee's negotiating position okay so there's been a motion made to go uh, to go into executive session. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, and I will 
Uh, need a roll call vote, please, on that. Aye. Yes. 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 So the motion carries. I do need to announce to the public that uh, we are moving into executive session. And as was stated in the motion, we are doing so because to hold this, uh, this uh, discussion in open session would have a detrimental effect on the school committee's negotiating position. I also have to inform the public that we will adjourn from executive session and not return to open session. Mm -hmm. So we will now move into executive session.